more success at the Olympics, more success on the international level in, in sports other than hockey. Uh, baseball starting to pick up. The Blue Jays are getting closer to the World Series. So the big question amongst boxing fans across the nation, who will be the fighter that will break the long streak of us not winning a world title from the major belts like WBC, WBA, and what turned into the IBF? Now, uh, because of uh, Lennox Lewis, Scotty Bulldog Olson, Dale Walters, uh, Sean O'Sullivan, uh, uh, Willie, uh, Willie DeWitt, Mr. Downey in Nova Scotia, the Olympians were doing well. Lennox eventually won the title in 88 at the Olympics. Uh, Edgar and Marcus, uh, we were wondering if these amateurs would go on to big success, but we had a lot of amateurs in the late 70s, early 80s that were in the pro ranks at the time, especially the Hilton brothers. And if any Canadian knows, the Hiltons have great respect for the fighting acumen. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was close to a half dozen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Matthew, Alex, Davy Jr., uh, Stewart. Unfortunately, Stewart uh, passed away. Uh, a lot of pressure on him, especially Maritimes in Quebec. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of the Hiltons, and he his skill eventually led him to a world title more more than uh, uh, more than anybody ever expected out of such a, a short way over two or three years. He was probably not only one of the most popular athletes in boxing. He was basically he had the weight of twenty three million people on his shoulders. And he carried that weight, ladies and gentlemen. So today we're going to talk about the great Matthew Hilton. Now, Matthew Hilton, uh, again, comes from a family, uh, a boxing family. His father was heavy in the sport for a number of years. Now, uh, he was known for kind of a combination of a brawler and a, and a what do you call a, a come-forward style like Roberto uh, Duran. Now, his best weight was at light middleweight and middleweight. Uh, five foot seven, like I said, very, very strong in the ring. Uh, best known again for his ability to press forward, uh, hit these big left hooks and right hands, and uh, basically allow him to build up points. Now, he started off uh, like most Canadian fighters in the, the Canadian system, had a lot of fights at the Paul Sauvé Arena. That's been a, been a mecca of boxing for a number of years, knocked off uh, various young contenders. Now, his big win of the early years had to be probably Eddie Hollett because that gave him uh, the tenth win of his career and uh, eventually moved up, moved up, better better quality of, of fighters. Now, 1985-86 was, to me, his, uh, his best sequence of uh, fights. Now, we started off in 1985 with a big win against Francisco de Jesus, a big 10-round decision, uh, then Roberto Hernandez, Lopez McGee. Now, this led him to a very, very interesting uh, fight against former middleweight champion Vito Anafermo. Now, uh, he entered a fight being a favorite because uh, Anafermo was a couple years away from his world uh, title reign in the late 1970s, but Anafermo was, was hard as nails. Now, this was held in the Montreal Forum, and uh, again, Matthew dominated the fight, winning by a fourth-round uh, stoppage. But the next fight became quite interesting. Uh, one of the better world champions on a welterweight division uh, of that era. He took on the, the incomparable Wilfred Benitez, who had gave uh, Duran and uh, some of the other welterweight champions everything they could handle uh, in, in his era. Now he had moved up in weight. Now that fight was held at the Paul Soviet Arena on uh, Valentine's Week, February 15, 86, and he won by a ninth round KO. So we knew something uh, w was uh, was going to happen. Continue to pile up wins, and uh, uh, you know, a great uh, U.S. coverage. He was involved in some of the major, uh, like I said, boxing interests in the states, and this allowed him to get more and more TV fights, as we say. Now, when he met Benitez and Antifermo, it took a little while for that world title fight to show up. And he eventually challenged for the IBF junior middleweight title uh, and eventually brought our nation its first world boxing title since the 1940s with a 15-round unanimous decision over defender the great and very, very tough as nails, Buster Drayton. Now, this fight was 
held on ABC uh, from Montreal, June 27, 87. It was also named KO Magazine's uh, TV Fight of the Year for that uh, year. Now, uh, this fight was, uh, 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 you know, uh, determined from start to finish, and it won the last fights in boxing history to go to full 15 rounds on incision uh, because of uh, various other incidents, including Boom Boom Man City against Doku Kim. Uh, most uh, title fights later on became 12 rounds, and 15 rounds uh, back then showed the toughness of both fighters. And again, uh, Buster uh, did enough uh, to win, but Matthew hit most of the big shots of the fight and was well deserving uh, for the victory. Now, uh, he made one defense uh, of the title on the Tyson Tyrell Biggs undercard of HBO October of that year, bu uh, busting and uh, bruising up a totally outclass Jack Callahan before the referee called things off after uh, two rounds. Now his next fight was a non-title match on ESPN in the middleweight division against Paul Whitaker of New Orleans. <coughs> We knocked down and brutally battered uh, before being KO'd in the fourth round. Now, uh, the next fight uh, was one he should have got the upper hand, but unfortunately he took on the very, very tough Robert Hines in November of 1988. Now, after knocking a bloody Hines down twice, he let Hines back in the fight, and Hines has steadily hammered a very tired uh, Hilton in winning a comfortable 12 round unanimous decision. Uh, after which Hilton, of course, lost his uh, crown. Now, from there on, uh, he tried several fights to uh, get back uh, to the uh, the world title uh, contention. After some middling results, his last crack as a title was on the infamous Foreman Cooney undercard in January 1990, when his eyes were uh, swollen shut in the by the punches of defending W.O. middleweight uh, titleist Doug DeWitt, again, a very uh, uh, strong fighter. Now, he was getting a lot of TV fights, and he began uh, kind of a reputation for Canadian fighters being as tough as nails. You look at Scotty Bulldog Olsen's success, him chasing Michael Carball. You know, you looked at Lenny Sluis, uh, because you have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, George Cavallo had a good chance to win the world title. He couldn't do it. Clyde Gray was a welterweight contender for years. Gaetan Hart had fought uh, Aaron Pryor for the title after uh, the the Cleveland Denny situation. That was that was a rough time. There was many Canadian prospects. Uh, Gary Summer Hayes, you know, half Canadian. But to see Matthew Hilton, someone that we all knew was uh, talented, knew he was determined, and uh, knew that there was something going to happen. But at the time, ladies and gentlemen, it was a very crowded light middleweight, middleweight, and super middleweight division. Uh, and I should know my uh, my cousin, Ronnie Savoy, was super middleweight champion of Canada uh, for a while. A lot of good fighters up there. And again, you had uh, James Tony around, Bernard Hopkins. <coughs> Over that era between the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, Roy Jones. So for him to win that title, and like I said, it's uh, like Doug DeWitt, uh, no disgrace losing to Doug. Doug was a very, very strong team, strong uh, fighter. And uh, Hilton ended his career in 1993 with a 10-round loss to uh, the very talented Daryl uh, Pee Wee Flint in Halifax. But I can tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. But Matthew, you know, he was uh, a big fan. He had big fans in Quebec, but he was a hometown New Yorker across Canada. All the Hilton's were and still are. And I'm honored to say that uh, a lot of the amateur boxers I've covered through the years look to the Hilton's as inspiration for their fighting style. And Matthew uh, and uh, Davey, Alex, uh, Stewart, uh, Davey Sr., uh, all the Hilton family, again, have motivated a lot of amateur fighters and now they're being down their coaches. So a lot of the amateur boxing across Canada, especially Eastern Canada, Ontario, New Brunswick, and the Maritimes, excuse me, Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, owes a lot to uh, the Hiltons. But I remember getting a two-liter of pop and watching that Matthew Hilton fight. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. A 15-round fight, that's like uh, anything. Uh, you see the 12-round fights now, they're tough. 15-round fights back in the day. You look at the alley defenses. You look at uh, the light heavyweight uh, fights, Galindez and everything else. You know, 15 rounds to show the medal. And that was a tremendous fight. It's on YouTube someplace if you want to check it out. But again, 
He ushered, like him and his brothers and some other fighters, ushered in the new golden era of Canadian boxing. And for that, we thank the Hiltons. We thank all our Olympians. We thank all our fighters. Aloja Dye, don't forget Aloja Dye. Uh, smooth as silk, that guy. Which led to, like, a success of the 90s and the 2000s, 2010s. Interbox and everything else and, you know, the TV fights. So, ladies and gentlemen, read up about the Hiltons. It's, it's uh, for the uninitiated, it's, a, it's an interesting look of, on, a, on a family. They've had their problems through the years, but like any family, you know, it happens. But we're talking boxing here. We're not judging anybody. Matthew Hilton, Davey, Alex, Stewart, all the Hiltons. Again, the talent, uh, immeasurable. Uh, numerous belts in the family, two world championships, uh, the greatest level of success, fought some of the best fighters of their era. Uh, again, last record for Matthew, 32-3-2. 32, so, uh, again, uh, you know, I'm honored to do this podcast. I When I started as a sports reporter, I covered a lot of Matthew and, uh, and uh, Davey uh, Jr. And uh, let me tell you, anytime I put the Hiltons in the paper, Ladies and gentlemen, everybody saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to watch that fight. Because they were, play, they were being played on TV on a regular basis, and they all had the good press uh, following them in uh, Quebec, in the Maritimes, and the East Coast of the States. And, you know, when you fight on ABC, you got to be good because you don't, you don't show people that don't draw, you know, as we say in the business, draw money. So that's the uh, a short look at the career of Batrew Hilton. If you like what we're doing here with our boxing podcast, Give us a like, comment, or subscribe. And uh, if anybody uh, is colleagues or friends in the Hilton, uh, leave some comments as to your memories of the uh, the boxing Hiltons. Uh, tell us about it, especially the fights in Montreal uh, and the Paul Sauvé, because that used to be rocking, ladies and gentlemen. Because the people that would go out for wrestling would go out for boxing, and there was a lot of crossover because the hometown heroes, wrestlers like the Rougeos and uh, everybody else, and the Hiltons were in the same bag. So, uh, interesting times on the Montreal uh, wrestling and boxing scene. Have a good day. Bye.